Hey everyone and welcome to another video and today guys I'm going to be touching on a very important and sensitive topic. This is all going to revolve around the loss of confidence in yourself as a player, slumping, and really knowing when to dodge in solo queue. Now, I get a lot of DMs and personal messages from you guys in the community saying things like this. Curtis, I've just lost all confidence in myself as a player. And to be honest, I'm terrified to click that queue up button because I know that when I go into that game, I'm going to play poorly anyway. I'm going to get outplayed and I'm going to lose and get flamed. I don't know. Is it my champion pool? Is it just my level of play? Um, is my mental too weak? What is going wrong? And they say things like this, Curtis, I don't even want to play the game anymore because it just makes me miserable. What is going wrong? And they get so upset because they set this goal for themselves, whether it was to get Platinum or Diamond or Master Tier, and they don't want to give up. And today, guys, I want to share with you a story because believe it or not, I deal personally with confidence issues as a player every single day. And I'm not just blowing smoke here. This is something that I literally battle with every single day. So the way I want to start this video is literally story time and talk about my slump, how I dealt with it and how I got out the other end. So for the majority of the season, guys, I hover around 400 to 500 LP, which is around high grandmaster. And occasionally I do jump to around 550 LP, which is approximately low challenger within our server. Then what actually happened, I started to direct my attention to other areas of my life, whether it was my coaching clients, my YouTube videos, moving houses, all these other external things. And as a result, I lost a lot of intensity towards my solo queue. I had no learning objectives and I was just playing to play the game. I wasn't actively trying to get better as a mid laner. Then as a result, I lost a lot of confidence through losing a lot of games. And I kept making excuses for myself. I kept saying, Curtis, it's fine. It's just a patch. You know, Spellbook got nerfed. Twisted Fate got nerfed. Nimbus Cloak got nerfed. All these reasons. I'm like, I would just played the victim. Like, oh yeah, that's why I'm losing on Galio and Twisted Fate now. It's nothing to do with your core gameplay issues. Just, it's fine. They'll get fixed and you'll get your ELO back in no time. Then as a result, I actually lost 400 LP in around a two week period, dropping from 490 to 90 LP. Then um, my default response was, okay, it just has to be my champion pool. It's not my fault. It has to be some external variable or some, ex some there has to be some excuse out there that explains why I'm losing all of this ELO. So I started shifting around my champion pool, randomly playing Ziggs or Cogmore mid or Velkos or Lux mid, just random champions. But inevitably, this did nothing for me, and I was still losing a lot of games. Now, you may ask, how the hell did I get out of this massive, massive slump? Because I was in a very big hole. So, I actually live with Nathan, who's a jungle coach. He has a channel. I'll link it in the, in the description below. And I said to him, Nathan, I am just in a hole right now, man. I have lost all my confidence. I don't know how to win a game anymore. I have no champion mastery. Like... What is going on? What should I do? Because sometimes you just need a, a second opinion. You just need someone external to get you on the right track. And he said to me, he said, Curtis, two questions. Why are you losing games? And two, how are you dying specifically in each game? So I went into the reviews. I went to my recent VODs because I record all of my games. And within the space of 10 to 15 minutes, I felt like an absolute idiot. I felt like an absolute idiot. Now, I looked at the VODs and every single game, I was either blowing flash to a gank or I was compensating for a jungle's bad call. I wasn't protecting myself at all times and I was getting really far behind just by just not tracking the enemy jungle, poor ward usage, just basic fundamental mistakes. It had nothing to do with my champion. It had nothing to do with getting certain things getting nerfed. It had nothing to do with my teammates. It was all on me. And for the first time in two or three weeks, I felt like I knew why I was losing games. And then as a result of this discussion and getting into the review, I climbed around 350 LP back in around a week. And now I'm sitting back at my, you know, around 430 LP. But what actually happened here specifically, guys? Well, first of all, I was reviewing all of my games, but I was reviewing it through this very like low confidence tilted mindset where every single VOD review, I was just trying to justify why my champion sucked or why I should lose that game. Whether I was trying to find an excuse. Oh yeah, my bot lane just lost or my jungle sucked or it was my champion's fault. If I was playing Zed here, I would have won it. Or if I was playing Fizz here, we wouldn't have won this game. Like I was always, I was directing all of my attention away from core gameplay issues. 
Now, in that process, I completely forgot about the importance of champion mastery, okay? Now, when I was at 450 LP, guys, I was playing at my level of play. And in order for me to take things to the next level and become a 600 or 700 or 800 LP player, I can only do that with champions I have complete and utter mastery over because I can't afford to use my mental capacity and my mental energy focusing on the small micro details. That should all be muscle memory, right? I shouldn't have to think about Oriana's Q range, when she spikes, when she's strong, how she wants to play team fights, what's her damage output. I should just know that information because then I can use my mental energy on things like, oh, what's the next objective? What's my winning side? When's Rift Herald coming up? What's the jungle path? Can I make a creative pick in the jungle? Or, you know, what can I do creatively to win this game? There's no way I can think about that stuff if I'm playing a champion that I don't have complete mastery over. So in order to help you understand this concept, guys, I want to use the analogy of talent trees. So some of you may be more familiar with this concept than others, but basically in MMOs, in some MMOs, they have these things called talent trees where you say your levels one to 10, you only have access to this initial talent tree, right? So you have a few things here, very basic um, fundamental key stats that you get. Then when you get to say level 10, you actually unlock a whole new talent tree that you didn't even know existed. Then, when you get to level 50, another whole new talent tree opens up, which has a whole new a bunch of new skills that you're going to get that you didn't ha previously have access to. This is the exact same in League of Legends, right? So let's just say you're a beginner Orianna player, right? And you, this is maybe for the first 1 to 30 games. You're only going to be able to focus on and improve on the absolute fundamentals of the champion, whether it's basic trading patterns, basic understanding of power spikes, power troughs, basic um, game pace understanding, just the real fundamentals of Oriana. Then when you get to a certain level where all these things are muscle memory and you understand them in and out, then you can get access to all these other these things, advanced things about Oriana. Then you get to that level, you, you, super, you surpass that level. Then there's these whole new things about the game that unlock that you had no idea about because you're able to put pieces together. You have a really solid understanding of that champion's identity and you can use that mental energy to make creative plays or have access to things like, yeah, like roaming, tempo assessment, um, crazy things that you never would have thought was possible. And this is actually explains why League isn't just a gradual, you don't just play a game, get better, next, I can climb now. It, it, it's, it's actually in big jumps. So it's like this. It's like in Spike. So let's just say you're playing Oriana. Um, you're probably going to have the same, same results. Then you have a breakthrough where all these things really start to become muscle memory. And then you step it up a gear. And then your level of play is just increased flat. Like you just, you just reached a new level of play. And then what happens over time, eventually a few things will start to become muscle memory. And then you spike to the next level. It's no, it's not, it's actually a myth that you just slowly improve like that. That's just not the case. It's all about making things muscle memory, right? And the talent tree was a really great way for me to be able to understand um, the importance, essentially, of champion mastery, okay? And this is actually why, when I learned Zed for the first time, guys, my skirmishing was exactly the same trash tier level skirmishing from my game one of Zed all the way to around game 60. If you compared my skirmishing, game one of Zed, to game 55, you probably couldn't tell much of a difference because it took me until game 60 to have muscle memory on my combos with Zed. I had to actively think, oh, how do I hit a shuriken? What combo should I use? I couldn't think about um, who I threaten, their positioning. Did they have summoners? Did they have exhaust? What was their itemization? I couldn't think about any of that because I was using all my mental capacity on thinking about how to hit a bloody shuriken. Okay? So this, for me, is why it's not a gradual improvement. Although there is an element of gradual improvement, it's, it's very much spikes making things into muscle memory. Very, very important to understand, guys. Okay, so let's actually go a little bit deeper to actually explain the importance of champion mastery, okay? So in order to help understand how to increase your level of champion mastery, we need to understand the four stages of competence. Okay, stage one unconsciously incompetent, right? You don't know what you don't know. So maybe you hadn't seen my content before, um, you hadn't seen anyone else play a specific champion, you have no idea what you don't know. You don't really know what's capable on that specific champion. Then, 
Um, you, may, you maybe start to begin to watch my Zed guide, let's take Zed for example, and you're like, ah, oh, wow, I didn't even know that existed. So now you realize how incompetent you are at that champion, for example. You're like, okay, now I know what's possible, but I still don't really know how to do it. Then you, you know, practice a few Zed games, you watch my content, you start to practice those few things, and you know, you start to become competent, but it requires a lot of mental energy, right? You need to think really hard for each step. So maybe you're up to game 40 of Zed, and you, you know how to do the combos, but it's not subconscious, not like unconsciously, you're not subconsciously or unconsciously able to do that combo. You need to put a lot of brain power, a lot of energy into perfecting that combo, right? And this is where you're setting your learning objectives and you're really trying to create that muscle memory. And then finally, you become unconsciously competent. This is when you're playing, you've played a lot of uh, games with that champion and then there's, there's no thinking required. It's like when I play Orianna, I don't need to think about Orianna's Q range, doing her ult, I know the range perfectly of the ultimate. It's all these things, it's just muscle memory. There's nothing going on up here about Orianna. I'm just thinking about how to win the game, okay? So this is the level you got to get to, and this is why having a small cha- one of the main reasons why having a small champion pool is so incredibly important because you're just not going to reach that level of champion mastery. You're just you're just going to scrape the surface of of what that champion is actually capable of. Now, going a little bit deeper within champion mastery, guys, I want to take you through an example. But before we go through the example, I want you to ask yourself this question about any champion in your champion pool. What does a perfect game look like with that champion? What does it look like? What boxes do you need to tick in order to have a perfect game with that champion? What, what is the gold amount that you need to get to in your early laning phase? Do you, what's the sort of game pace that you're after? What sort of trades do you need to take? What junglers do you want to be paired with? How often do you need to roam? What champions would you like to verse? What champions would you not like to verse? What does this perfect game look like? If you don't know what a perfect game looks like, then how in the hell are you going to be able to replicate it? Beats me. I don't know how you're going to be able to be consistent on a champion if you don't even know what a perfect game looks like. And you shouldn't just know what it looks like. You need to know what it feels like. What is that power? What is that those power troughs, those power spikes feel like? And you'll know when you have champion mastery because when you go into every, any single game, doesn't matter what champions are in the game, you will know your chances of winning that game just by seeing the champions in that game and just knowing that this the game pace. You'll know, holy crap, this game is getting played way too fast for Orianna. All right, so in order for me to win this game, this is exactly what I need to do. I need to slow down the pace of the game. I need to isolate the lane. I need to put my vision on this side. What can I do to you know alter the game state? You'll really start to use your champion mastery or your champion knowledge to increase the chances of you winning that game. Now, let's just say theoretically, guys, I just... Pick the Nivea randomly. I don't. I don't play a Nivea. He's not. She's not in my pool, and I don't. I don't really know much about that champion. Now, if I'm in a game with a Nivea, and let's just say I'm just chilling in the laning phase, whatever. I know how to click buttons. I'm not an idiot. If the game's even, or even maybe I'm slightly behind, the chances I know how to make any sort of proactive play or creative play is so incredibly low because I just don't know the limits of this champion. And if I get ahead the chances I throw my lead are very, very high because my awareness will be so low because I'm thinking about the micro of my champion, my ranges, my mana cost, what what do I build? I don't know any of this information. So I'm not going to be able to really push my lead. I'm probably just going to die randomly. Um, I don't know what fights I should or shouldn't take because I'm not really aware of what boxes I need to tick. I don't know what conditions a Nivea loves in order in for to be effective in team fights or skirmishes. I have no idea. I also don't know who I threaten nor who threatens me because again, threat assessment always comes from knowing your ranges, your damage output, your level of durability, that sort of thing, or even my power spikes and power troughs. The list goes on and on and on. So hopefully you're starting to or begin to understand how important champion mastery is and why having a small champion pool is so incredibly important. Now, given everything we've covered so far in this video, plus my experiences with constantly slumping and losing confidence and talking with other people within the Discord community, I've come up with something called the slumping cycle. And where it all begins, step number one is for whatever reason, someone loses a lot of games. It can be due to anything, whether they come home pissed off from work and lose a bunch of games, whether they come off a bad breakup and play really tilted 
to lose games, whether they play drunk, they draw with a toxic friend, they're learning a new champion, or whatever reason, they go on a massive loss streak. Now, as a result of losing a lot of games, you naturally lose a lot of confidence in your level of play. And this is where the slump really begins. This is where you don't want to queue up anymore. You play bad every game. You actually play wor or lower than your level of play. You're easily tilted. You give up after one mistake. And this is where things get really, really messy and you're literally dug yourself a massive hole. Then, as a result of this loss of confidence, the number one scapegoat is the champion that you play. And the default response, even for myself, this is not just for you guys, this literally happened to me. My default response is, my champion sucks ass. I am going to pick a different champion because I'm sick of playing Orianna into Zed. I'm just going to play Zed now. Or I'm sick of playing Fizz into Cassidy. I'm just going to play Cassidy now. That champ's OP because you're just thinking is very short term. You're not logical. You're just angrily changing your champion pool. And as we know, due to not having any champion mastery, you lose more games still and it doesn't, it doesn't really change anything. Then eventually, over time, you've actually, you know, you've gone through that whole cycle and eventually you go back to your original champion pool on the champions that you know really well and you eventually start to play well again and you build that confidence back up. But this entire cycle is completely avoidable. And we're going we're gonna to go over a little bit later what I recommend and how I deal with it. But um, we'll come back to this a little bit later. But this is generally what the cycle looks like. And what I recommend is we need to intervene here. Okay, you lose a few games, fine. We need to intervene here before we severely damage our confidence and waste a ridiculous amount of time and go through the rest of the cycle. So we'll come back to this a little bit later, but I just wanted to introduce this as a an overarching concept, guys. So I get a lot of questions from you guys in the Discord community asking for my take on dodging games. So I thought it'd be really fitting to do an entire section on it. So one of the main benefits of Champion Mastery, guys, is that you should, in theory, have a very solid understanding of what champions your champion does well into, as well as what champions you struggle against. You should also know the game pace you are after, how your champion actually wins games, and what you hate having on your team. So if you're in champ select and you see the enemy composition having multiple champions that directly counter your champion, or even on your, your team composition having multiple champions that just don't fit well with your champion, then I do recommend considering dodging. And I did dodge a lot of games on my climb back up to my rank. And the way I'm actually going to do this, I'm going to go over two separate examples with different champions and really get across my thought process when dodging games. Because I'm not going to be able to go over every single situation every single champion. So I'm going to try and, I guess, get across the core fundamental reasons for dodging and how you would go about breaking down whether a game is dodgeable or not. So as we've probably seen already from this video, having a deep understanding of your champion's identity is crucial for knowing when to dodge, right? Because you're going to really know the ins and outs of your champion. And this, and this is actually one of the main reasons why having a large champion pool is not good because you're just not going to understand what your champion is good against and what your champion is bad against or given in that game, given these champions, how you need to navigate that game to get a victory. Um, this is also why, by the way, being a one trick can be very detrimental because you're going to have to dodge a lot of games essentially because there's going to be a lot of games. Um, you're going to be either straight counter picking yourself um, or putting yourself in very sticky situations. But anyway, let's go over an example. Now diving into this example here, guys, this pink border represents me. I'm playing Orianna into LeBlanc. I've got a Nunu jungle into Trundle and I have a Vladimir top into Camille. And in my opinion, without even seeing the bot lane matchup, this is a highly dodgeable game and I probably would dodge this game 95% of the time. And there's a bunch of reasons why. The first one is that we are triple AP topside. Whenever I see any composition with triple of like triple of the same damage source on the top side of the map, whether it's triple AD or triple AP, I am highly considering dodging, especially when I'm versing relatively like a lot of bruises or uh, tanky champions. If I'm versing a lot of squishy tops, then it's not a big of a deal. But if I'm versing any champion like Trundle or even Camille to a certain extent, I know it's going to be a very, very, very hard game because they can buy the sit on a cow and they're literally never going to die. Um, and it's literally my worst nightmare as, a, as an AP control mage because then I'm going to have to buy an early void staff which ruins my complete build path which makes it very efficient for them in skirmishes even just sitting on a null magic mantle very very bad now the main reason this is a highly dodgeable game though is I have an unfavorable jungle matchup a very hard mid, uh, mid 1v1 matchup 
And just looking at the micro interactions, Camille hard counters Oriana because it's an insanely high gap closing dive champion, which Oriana hates versing. Oriana hates versing low threat compositions. LeBlanc as well is high threat, a lot of gap closing. So we've got two champions that want to dive onto me and literally can disregard my range advantage. We have a jungle matchup in which Trundle is going to have complete river control. I'm going to have no river control versus LeBlanc, which I'm going to have to basically sit under my tower the entire game. Camille and Trundle have a lot of gank threat onto a Vladimir, especially when they have complete river control as well, because what is Vlad going to pull? Is Vlad going to pull the E, the Camille E, the Camille R, the Trund like, Trundle pillar is going to slow him down anyway. It's going to be a complete nightmare. And even if we have a 3v3 river skirmish or some form of 2v2 skirmish, as soon as Trundle hits 6, because Nunu builds tank, Trundle's just going to be able to ultimate Nunu. We're never going to be able to burst a Trundle, and especially once he has a cow, we're going to have zero river control, zero objective control. I'm going to sit on the tower. LeBlanc's going to be able to dive Vladimir or dive side lanes. It's going to be an absolute nightmare. So just in terms of pressure, in terms of just my identity, what sort of champions I want to verse, this is just an absolute nightmare. And on top of that, we're versing two insanely mobile champions. And we have basically no champions with gap closes or lockdown. Low CC compositions with champions with, with high mobility is an absolute nightmare because how are we ever going to be able to lock down Camille and LeBlanc? Nunu has zero kill threat onto LeBlanc. She just Ws away. Nunu wants to verse very immobile, squishy champions where there's or either I have CC or setup, we have good damage spread, and we're versing very immobile champions with low threat. So all of our champions, in theory, get count get counted by all three of their champions. So micro interactions, damage spread, all these regions, even just game pace as well. We want to scale as well. LeBlanc and Trundle can really push the pace of the game. There's just a ridiculous amount of, of reasons here. So... This is why, guys, if you don't have an understanding of your champion's identity, then how are you going to know whether to dodge this game or not? And as you, and this is why as well, by the way, the more you play a champion, the more you'll understand how other roles affect your champion as well. I know Camille screws me as a champion, even though I'm not versing Camille. I know in mid-game, when it comes to team fights, I cannot team fight against this Camille and Trundle and LeBlanc. I'm not even thinking about my 1v1. I When I'm in champ select, I put just as much of a emphasis on what is in the other other the other roles as well as what I'm versing 1v1. If I'm versing, say, a Rakan support as well, a Rakan support, I know Rakan is an absolute nightmare for Oriana as well because it's high engage threat. They can easily close the gap and get onto me. I don't want to verse a lot of diving champions, okay? Now, a few notes on the side here. These games just happen sometimes, whether it's just unlucky due to people's lack of game understanding or champion pool issues or them not understanding their champion's identity. And note, I do dodge off-world junglers as well. If I have an off-world jungle with literally zero games played or whatever, I will also dodge a lot of the time because if you have an off-world jungle, especially in higher elo games... It's an absolute nightmare. So um, hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight here. And these are a lot of the variables that I do consider. And just going over one other quick example here. And this is another absolute nightmare situation. The damage spread isn't really a problem. I'm the Fizz here. We have AP and AD. But what do we see here? Fizz and Graves and Jace all get relatively counted by Poppy. Or specifically Fizz and Graves because of the dashes. Nidalee hard or not, I'd say pretty considerably counters Graves in terms of Control, tempo, clearing, and just straight 1v1 skirmishing. Kassadin encounters me 1v1, and we have zero CC into a Kassadin, so zero lockdown. So this is not, I can't, we can't stop Kassadin from scaling this game. And even if I get ahead and somehow pick Nidalee in the jungle with a, a weird tempo reset, that's not going to be enough to prevent this Kassadin from scaling and taking over this game, because we're three relatively squishy champions into a Kassadin. And which is an absolute nightmare. Yes, their damage spread isn't the best because they got, got AP here and here and Poppy doesn't do too much AD damage. But we don't have any tanks or necessarily big bruises. So, um, and they're probably going to have an AD carry anyway. So it's not going to be too bad. Um, there's just so many reasons here why this is just a bit highly, highly dodgeable game. So as you can start to see here, I'm thinking not only what's in terms of what's happening in my lane 1v1. I'm thinking about what's happening 1v1 here. What's happening 1v1 in the jungle? Are we going to have river control? Who's going to have top pressure here? How can they itemize? When it gets to skirmishes, who's going to be able to win? Um, am I going to be able to push the pace of the game? I don't know. Even if 
Poppy builds armor, and I can somehow get a weird roam onto Poppy. It's going to be highly unlikely because Nidalee is going to have full river control and tempo over this Graves. Um, and on top of that, how am I going to get pressure versus Cassidy? It's going to be incredibly hard. And Poppy as a champion is very tanky, so there's that as well. It's going to be so hard for me to dive a champion like Poppy. And then at, at the end of the day, even if I get one kill for my Jace, he's going to be completely nullified as soon as his Poppy gets a Barmies and a Bramble Vest anyway. So I just don't feel confident in being able to push the pace of this game. So hopefully this gives a little bit of insight. And, and as you can see, guys, there's a lot to consider. And this is why you've got to have champion mastery. You've got to strive for champion mastery and really get into the details and literally think, what does a perfect game look like for my champion? What are the boxes I need to tick? What is my champion's identity? And how do these champions prevent me from being able to adhere to my champion's identity or create certain conditions within a game, okay? Now, I wanna quickly go over some of the dangers of slumping. Now, my least favorite part about slumping is just the absolute time-wasting element. Like, not only am I not improving by playing while slumping, I'm literally setting myself behind by losing LP, and in some severe cases, you can actually make yourself a worse player. If you play while in this really low confidence, I guess terrible slumping phase, you can create some very bad habits. So it's a it's a very, very toxic situation to get into. And you've got to be very careful and try and, and use your friends and use your people around you to, um, and I guess develop that self-awareness to just realize, holy shit, I'm actually in a massive slump right now and I should not play the game. The other one that is very dangerous is this is more of like a mentality thing, but just the straight lack of intensity as a result of slumping, it fuels that excuse. Because let's just say you go into a game and you lose, you make a mistake. You go into that VOD review, this is what's gonna you're gonna say to yourself mentally. Oh, screw that, Curtis. Like you don't need to worry about the mistake. If you were really focused, or if you were trying really hard, you wouldn't have made that mistake. That mistake was just uncharacteristic. And that is such an incredibly toxic line of thought. And that can that can absolutely screw you in the long run. Because in my opinion, guys, in order to actively or efficiently improve at League of Legends, you need to be able to give your 100%. Because if you're not giving your 100%, then how do you know what your level of play is? You're always going to be playing below your level of play. And you're always going to have this, this, this toxic excuse or invisible narrative running in the back of your mind. Slumping generally goes hand in hand with focusing on like just a thousand things. Like you're focusing on my team fighting, my warding, my roaming, my trading, my CSing. Like you're, you're just completely overwhelmed because you're bad at everything when you're slumping. You're, you're, you're literally not happy. There's probably going to be no elements of your gameplay that are good. So then you're going to look at your VODs and be like, holy shit, I'm just bad at everything. And then people focus on a thousand things at once, which makes the entire league experience incredibly miserable, not fun at all. You must be only trying to pick one or two things at a time. Now, another thing you guys really need to get your head around is that slumping and losing are two different things. You can still play well and lose a game. You can still win a game, but have bad practice. You can still lose a game, but have great practice. And this ties into probably one of my biggest pet peeves when I was a head coach you know, during that scrim culture was that a lot of people, both coaches and players, had this very results-oriented level of thought. It's like, if they win a game, they're like, yes, we're happy, we had great practice. And if they lost, they're like, oh, we had such bad practice today, I didn't learn anything, it was just a terrible day. But that's actually just not the case. At the end of the day, guys, all practice is for, is all we're trying to look for is, did we make good quality decisions and if we didn't make good quality decisions, why was that the case? I don't really care necessarily about the outcome of that game. Yes, that is a metric we will consider and take into account, but we need to get way more specific than that. We need to get into the details. We need to see why, what led to that win? What led to that loss? What did we do well? Let's go specifically into those decisions that we made that led to that, that loss or that win. Because at the end of the day, guys, all we're trying to do is increase the quality of our decision making every single game. So what would I recommend doing to build back that confidence and get out of that slump period? This is where you need to get into the review and you need to be incredibly specific. You can't just afford to go into a VOD and be like, oh yeah, I lost that skirmish for 15 minutes and then the game was just over. Oh yeah, my bot just died to a gank and then they entered and the game was over. You need to be incredibly specific. You need to put a disproportionate amount of time into the first 10 minutes of the VOD and use this video to help you here. I'm actually going to link a video. Hopefully, I can maybe put a hyperlink here or I'll link it in the description below where I literally cover each rank 
what to look for in your VOD review. So it doesn't matter if you're a silver or a gold or a platinum player, this is what you need to refer to, okay? And if you don't go over your, if you don't be specific in your VOD review, you're not gonna know what to focus on. And I guarantee you, within the space of 15 minutes, if you can look at it very objectively, very calmly, you will see the trends. Either you're not using your ward, you're dying to ganks. You're making very poor decisions in terms of following your jungle. You're dying solo because you're taking really bad trades. You're, you're keeping the wave in very bad spots. So you're getting ganked all the time. You will see the trends, trust me, and use my content to help guide you um, to find what is going wrong, wrong specifically. And you cannot afford to be have this very blasé, whatever attitude in your VOD review. You've got to be specific, guys. Trust me. And it will save you a lot of time in the long run. And guys, you've got to understand that climbing and improving, it requires a lot of time. But not just time. It requires the effective use of time. So I want you guys to think back about when you first learned how to drive a car. Some of you may know how to drive. Some of you may not. But some of the first lessons, whether it's your dad or your mom or some, some instructor, what do you go through? They say, all right, you got to put your hand here with like 10 o'clock and 3 at 2 o'clock, whatever it is. You got to put your feet on the pedals in a certain way. You got to like check the mirror. You got to do all this like boring shit. It's just, it's like really boring. You got to do all the fundamentals of how to drive a car. You don't just go in and learn how to do Tokyo Drift in like the first lesson, right? Just like VOD reviewing learning the game. You don't just skip over champion identity. You don't just skip over basic trading patterns, CSing, warding, just the fundamentals of laning. You don't just go to roaming, tempo assessment, side lane awareness, deep warding, jungle tracking. You gotta do all the boring shit, right? It is a little bit boring, but that is the what you need to do to make muscle memory so you can level up, get unlock those talent trees that I mentioned before when you're like level 50 or whatever. Um, all right, so you're not going to go from learning how to drive basic fundamentals of holding the steering wheel to Tokyo Drift in just one lesson, okay? You got to take your time, relax, and go over the boring stuff first. And if I were to go back in time, guys, when I was, you know, really tilted, or not tilted, I guess really low in confidence and just complaining, blaming my teammates, blaming the patch or whatever, I would tell my ass to shut up and rather than seek problems seek solutions. There has to be a core reason why I'm losing every single game. And I, I fell into that victim mindset where I was focusing on everything that was like out of my control because it made me feel better about myself. It makes me feel so much better about myself that it's not my fault. That has to be someone else's fault or just some bullshit external excuse. Like I don't, cause I, I'm protecting my ego. It's not me, it's someone else or something else that's not to do with my level of play. I had to become vulnerable and be honest with myself in order to get better again and get back to my level of play. And the other point here is that I would also tell myself that I don't necessarily have to play ranked. A lot of the time, I was just playing ranked out of boredom or I was playing ranked out of habit. You need to come in with intensity. You need to come in being your best self or playing at your level of play. If you're not feeling it, you're not up for it, you haven't had enough sleep, you're in a bad mood, you had a fight with your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever, just don't play ranked. Play another game. Play Fall Guys. Play bloody um, Valorant or whatever. Play another game. Or even just play ARAMs. You don't have to play ranked every single time because trust me, you will regret it after when you look, you see that minus 25 LP and you're like, God damn it, dude. I have to play another one because I can't end on a loss. And then you play another one you lose again. And like, oh, I don't want to end on a loss. I've got to play one more. And you play another one you lose again. Like, you just don't want to go through that cycle, guys. Okay, play another game. Do something else. Or even just get off the computer. So I want to end this video by sharing a few findings from my kangaroo tier coaching sessions, which might really help you in your own, your own climb. Okay. Cause I know a lot of people want coaching from you. So I thought I'd actually just share a few findings. So one big trend I've seen through all my coaching clients is that a lot of you guys are going into, into games without any intention or awareness of mini games. You, don't, you, you must have a hypothesis about what gold amount you are ideally aiming for because this affects the, the game pace, like how you're playing trades in the lane, how you're going to manage your wave, the rationing out of your resources. Like when I go into a game as Oriana, if I'm in a specific matchup, I'm either actively trying to heavy trade and go back for an early Dark Seal, Tier 1 Boots base, or maybe early Dark Seal Amp Tomb base, or... I'm taking it really slow, rationing out my mana, keeping the wave on my side, trying to get to 1300 gold for my lost chapter. I'm actively thinking about this because this is what will dictate how I'm going to play the lane. If I don't know how much gold I need or when I want to base, 
then how the hell am I know what sort of trades I'm going to take? How do I know what sort of, how I'm going to ration out my resources? How do I know when I need to use my abilities on the wave and when I don't need to? Or you just don't know. So this is what will lead to consistency in your games, all right? And this directly ties to understanding of power troughs and power spikes. It was fascinating to me that watching a lot of these coaching clients that they just weren't thinking about the basic power spikes and basic power troughs of your champion. They're like heavy trading as Casio with a mana crystal level three with like a, a Z or something or like a talent. It's like, dude, just chill out. You need to get to your you need to get to your tier and like a cloth armor. Why are you fighting heavy trading now? You barely have a mana pool. Um, just some really basic mistakes. And guys, if you aren't sure about what your mini game is or how much gold you need to base on or when your champion's um, strong or weak, literally watch high low vods, type in YouTube that exact matchup, watch other people, watch my content, ask others in the Discord, just have a hypothesis and refine. If you go into that game thinking, okay, my hypothesis is here, I can afford to take it slow, and I'm going to base on 1100 gold for a Mercs or a, a Sork Treads or whatever. If you come out of that game, you go into the VOD review and be like, to be honest, I think that was a stretch. I don't think I can get away with that next time. I don't even think it was that effective. If I actually played it faster here, it probably would have felt much better because then I could have pushed my lead here. I could have taken these sorts of trades or whatever. Um, you'll start to realize and you can compare with other people's gameplay. It is a knowledge thing, but if you don't have a hypothesis in the first place, you're going to be screwed. The next one is that people aren't actively considering the fundamental strengths and weaknesses of their champion when making decisions in the game. And they see things like this, where you've got like a tier Cassiopeia with no blue buff and Conqueror tr opting in for a 2v2 with a Lee Sin Galio with like a half mana pool. When they could have actually pinged back, not gone for that fight, slow down, play for the wave, and just chill. And it sounds really basic, guys, but you'd be surprised. If you actually look at your VODs, a lot of the time you guys are opting in for fights or taking certain trades that are completely incoherent with your champion's identity. You should know the basic strengths and weaknesses of your champion. Are you a scaling front to back champion? Or are you a scrappy, fast paced skirmisher? What sort of fights do you want? What sort of game pace? You need to be thinking about the basic strengths and weaknesses of your champion. So, for the last point here, guys, I've got a niche little bit of advice for you. When in your VOD review, okay, when you go to a specific moment in the game, don't just think about, don't just review it very surface level. Think about where your attention was focused in that specific moment, because this will be an indicator of what is muscle memory and what isn't. So if you go to minute three where you take this bad trade, what were you thinking of in that moment? Were you trying to think about the range of your ability? Were you thinking about your mana cost? Were you thinking about, like, what were you thinking about specifically? We think about CSing. What what were you what where was your attention focused? What you'll realize by going over the doing this exercise is that you'll realize, ah, I'm actually having to put way too much mental energy on CSing, which is a problem. Which means that that should probably be your learning objective because you can't worry about like warding or jungle tracking or anything before if you're having to spend all this mental capacity timing your trades with CS or having to last it with auto attacks, that's why you got to go back to square one. You got to go back to the fundamentals of very, very basic lane stuff um, before you can really focus on other aspects of the game. So it can really help you dictate what's muscle memory and what isn't. So hopefully you gained something from this video. Again, I don't have all the answers. This is just my take on this specific topic, what's worked for me. Um, so hopefully you can take something away from it. I really appreciate all the support guys and I'll be making sure to pump out more content. Cheers.